So welcome this morning to our guest lecture with James Church. Um, just by way of introduction, James is the co-founder and COO of Robert Massacre. I came across James via LinkedIn because <laughs> he, as all of us, tries to connect to people and I think either you clicked on me or I clicked on you and I saw what you're doing and, and I saw your book and I was really excited about the book because it fits very much into what I teach here as a professor of entrepreneurship, but I'm also a professor of finance professor, and I like this kind of combination of the two. And I thought we have to invite James here for this class, and of course my students in my class and K students are also here, so that's quite good. We're going to record that just just for your information. It's going to be recorded and it's going to be, going to be available on my uh, YouTube channel. James is going to talk about his six principles of a perfect pitch. And I think he's the perfect pitch for us to learn about how to do a perfect pitch. Because as you know, my focus is always finance and how to create value, but you need to communicate it. And I think it's not just the financial side, but it's also how to pitch the financial side, how to communicate it, and we spoke about it before this uh, presentation here, and just we agreed that James' background is in marketing and branding, he's got a bachelor's degree in graphic design from the University of London, no, the University of Lincoln, uh, and then he's also in a degree from the Chartered Institute of Marketing, so uh, perfectly, uh, perfect fit to, our, pitch, uh, a fit to us, what we're teaching here, and of course, you advised and helped many, many clients in the UK, understand in raising money and it's all about it so we're looking forward to hearing from you uh, I think you're going to speak for around 20 minutes 20 30 minutes then you can ask some questions so we do a QA, and a and then at the end Kay is going to say some word of things thank you very much over to you awesome. thank brilliant you. thanks for thanks for having me um, everyone so yeah let, let me start off with a quick introduction to myself just sort of adding to, to what was said there so I'm the author of the best-selling book investable entrepreneur um, and as was said, my background's in brand and marketing. So you might wonder how have I ended up teaching people and supporting entrepreneurs to raise millions in, in funding. And, and essentially, we started a brand agency, Robot Mascot started life as a branding agency. And we were working with exciting entrepreneurs, building incredible brands. And we soon realized that they started to want to pitch for money to scale and grow their business, and they were terrible at it. And they were getting what we called the zombie stare, this, this horrible glazed over look from investors. We wanted to help them, uh, help them with that because we had a design brand communication background. And, and over time, that led us to specializing in investor communication specifically. And then the book ends up as the combination of all of that research, all of that insight to, to try and help and teach entrepreneurs how to combine both the business strategy and finance elements of business into clear, compelling and articulate communication that gets investors excited, makes them want to back your venture. So it's a, very much a hybrid of those two parts of business that we're going to be covering um, today. Um, so essentially Robot Mascot is um, an investment readiness agency. We basically specialise in taking entrepreneurs um, under our wings and helping support them to produce these communication materials that they need to convince investors. We've done that um, with more than 3,000 founders to date, um, and when we work with them, they've come 40 times more likely to raise the investment they need. They've raised more than 220 million to date, so the insights I'm going to share with you today will deliver these types of results. We've won global awards and, and national awards for the work that we do, but ultimately, at our core, the reason that I do things like this, the reason we do the work that we do is we just want to see great ideas and innovations flourish. We want them to succeed and we get so frustrated at seeing them fail to raise the investment and achieve their potential because of their inability to communicate effectively with investors. So I want to start today with the idea that there, there's more opportunities, there's more ideas and there's more possibilities than ever before. And Now's a really great time to be an entrepreneur. We are witnessing a massive shift in technology that we can use to our advantage. We can use it to develop really valuable and exciting intellectual property that becomes highly, highly valuable 
um, to someone who wants to acquire our business later down the line. But we can also use technology to reduce our overheads, employ a global workforce. Um, gone are the days where your business has to uh, rely on the talent within a five, ten mile radius of your business. You can work with people all over the world, brilliant, brilliant talent to come and help you grow and scale your business. So, so we're really seeing a pinnacle and a shift in entrepreneurship that we can capitalise. And as a, as a result of that, there's never been a better time to raise investment either. There is more capital than ever being invested into startup businesses who are all leveraging technology in different it doesn't matter whether you are a restaurant chain or a, or a, a SaaS technology business, you can leverage technology to launch, scale and grow your business and it's resulted in more investment. Um, and this is what's been happening. Um, so obviously we haven't got this year, but, but, but the last few years have been absolutely incredible. So we had a pandemic boom um, in early stage investment where suddenly, um, for um, during the COVID years, I think everyone was sitting at home, they were bored, they weren't spending their money going on holidays, so angel investors were investing into businesses. Um, and we saw a massive, massive um, jump in the pandemic period. Now that's slightly reduced, it's not, it was never going to be sustainable at those levels. Um, but even if we discount the pandemic boom, this strange period where there was loads of uh, investment into, into uh, businesses more than usual, we can see that we're 19% we're up last year versus 20, uh, 2019 or 2020, so just as we were entering that pandemic period. So um, huge amounts of funding across Europe going into startup businesses. So early stage investment, by the way, is investment into businesses from concept stage up to about a million in revenue, looking to sort of go on to 10x that. Um, and then you start to get into sort of series B, C rounds, which are, which are later stage funding. So an incredible amount, $17 billion last year invested into early stage businesses. We check sizes, people typically asking for anything from 100K all the way up to 10, 20 million to invest into their early stage businesses. So a huge amount of funding is available for you right now, but this is the problem you're gonna face. There's also more people trying to capitalize this than ever before. There's more entrepreneurs than ever. Um, the average angel investor is seeing about 10 pitch decks every week. Of those, they probably find about one of interest, and of that, uh, they tend to make on average about two investments a year. So that's 520 pitch decks landing into an investor's inbox, probably take about 52 meetings in a year off the back of that, and then they make in just two investments. So your chances of securing funding are pretty low. Um, just less than 1% of businesses end up securing funding from VC and angels combined. And this was the st statistic, by the way, that really made me take notice and say, I'm sure we can change that, I'm sure we can do better, because a lot of the investors I was speaking to were sitting on capital. They wanted to invest, and they were saying they've got more money than ever to invest, but there's just not the right people to invest in. I was like, surely not. Surely there is, there is enough people for you to deploy your capital. So how do we increase this statistic? How do we make our clients 40 times more likely to raise investment? So we do that by an incredible pitch, incredible storytelling, all the way through from the pitch through to the business strategy. And I want you to think of you going out for pitching to investment. Firstly, it's nothing like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank or any of those programs that you need to get that idea out of your head. Um, but you are pitching into uh, an investor and, and you've got to think about what the purpose of that pitch is. Now, when we look at, um, when we look at what's happening on uh, TV, when we watch Dragon's Den, when we watch Shark Tank, we see stacks of cash on a table, and we give a great pitch, there's a few Q&As, and then everyone says, yeah, I want to invest or I don't, and they walk off into the sunset with the money. The reality is, what happens after the TV cameras um, uh, pause is a huge amount of due diligence, and only about 20% of deals in the debt actually end up going through. So the purpose of the pitch isn't actually to raise money at all. The purpose of the pitch is to open conversations that allow you to have, um, have go through that due diligence process with investors and talk through your uh, full business case in more detail to the point at which you win their trust and their money. So the pitch is more like the key to opening the safe. It's not the tool that allows you to gain access to the capital. We're gonna come onto the tools that allow you to, to ace the due diligence process in a minute. But the pitch itself is merely the key to opening the door. You're really pitching for an investor to invest their time. You're never really pitching an investor to invest their money, not in that instance. You're just saying, trust me enough, I've got enough information, I'm impressive enough, that you feel it's worthwhile sitting down with me in a meeting to explore this further. 
to take things further. That's all your pitch is doing. It's a communication tool to open conversations and the rest happens in the due diligence that follows and that's where um, our six principles will come in uh, later on. So the key concept here is that great ideas don't raise investment. Any founder that thinks it's the brilliance of their idea that's going to raise them the investment are ultimately the founders that are going to fail. Because investors are looking for two things. They're looking, yes, for a brilliant business idea, but the caveat is always that this business idea has to be in a highly scalable market, one that could potentially deliver these investors huge returns on their money. If they put one million into you, they want to be able to you to sell your business in maybe five to 10 years time for 30 times, 10 to 30 times more than what it's valued at today. So if I put a million in you today, I want to be able to sell my shares in your business in five to 10 years time for 10 to 30 million. So we need to believe that the market is big enough and the concept's big enough and there's enough customers out there to want to buy this so that the business can hit, hit that type of um, scale. But the second thing they're looking for is a founder that they can trust to execute on that vision because we can all have great ideas, but we can't all execute on them. The best entrepreneurs in the world are the ones that either are great at execution or admit that they're crap at execution and get a great team around them to do it. Elon Musk, for example, I can't imagine him slaving over a spreadsheet, making sure the operations of the business are working. He gets really great people around him to do that stuff. He's the visionary, he's the maverick, and he gets great people around him to, uh, to execute on things, and that's why he's become successful. So great ideas don't raise investment. What raises investment is great communication. Great communication to investors allows you to articulate your business case in a way that makes them want to back it. And this is what about 80% of the investors that I interviewed when writing my book were telling me, words to this effect. Like I see this guy 10 pictures a day, not a week. And it's the communication of the idea that ultimately decides whether or not they invest. Because founders have to inspire they have to inspire investors, and if they can inspire investors, they know they can inspire top talent to come and join their team, because they want to be part of that same vision. And that talent is probably going to join you for less than the market rate salary in return for some share options, because they believe in it so much. You're going to be able to attract game-changing commercial partnerships with an incredible pitch, because people with more established businesses are going to want to support you, give you access to their database, their mailing list, so that you can launch your product. Great pitch is going to give you access to the best advisors. All of these things come from a great pitch, and that's why the communication and your ability to communicate your idea in an, ex in an inspiring way unlocks so many uh, doors with investors, because it's a key part of the overall picture. The idea may be great, but can the founder lead this vision? That's what they're really looking for. So too many great ideas are failing because of poor communication. And ultimately, it results in this, that zombie stare I talked about. You pitch your idea. You may have all experienced it. I know I did when I first started my business. You tell people what you do, and you're greeted with this look, this blank, glazed over, over stare. Like, what on earth are they on about? I've no idea what it is that they do. So this is what we need to solve, right? And we do that through the six principles of the perfect pitch. So I'm going to um, come on to each of these in a moment. But there's three key phases. So the first couple of um, principles there are in the preparation phase. So this is what I was talking about when I was uh, speaking about um, everything that happens after the pitch, the due diligence phases. In order for us to have a successful pitch, in order for us to engage with investors and open up those opportunities for further meetings, we need to build that pitch on a solid foundation. Because ultimately it's that solid foundation that's going to come uh, come out in the, in the due diligence phase and, and ultimately result in the investment. So I'll let you into a little, little uh, secret. Um, when we first started pivoting our business from branding agency into investor communications agency, it was the four principles of the perfect pitch. And we didn't have these first two. Um, and it was all about, let's create an awesome pitch that gets investors excited. And it was all about communication and brand and storytelling. And that was great, our clients became 10 times more likely to raise investment, fantastic. But what we found was that they were all getting meetings, but not enough of them were closing the deal. And we asked ourselves why. And we started questioning our clients as to, you're getting all the meetings, why aren't they closing the deal? Well, they didn't like my projections, they didn't like my business plan, they didn't feel like I was able to actually execute on this brilliant vision that we put together, this great story we had told. 
They just didn't feel the two aligned. There was a big gap between what we were saying we were going to do and their belief in my ability to actually execute on it. And that's where these first two principles then materialized. They needed a solid plan of action of what they're going to do in the short and the long term so they could clearly um, and compellingly tell that to an investor and they needed a really great set of financial projections that mapped out the financial future of this business and uh, made the investors feel that you were financially literate and really understood the numbers around your, your business and the metrics you need to achieve. So once we plug those into the, into the system, our clients became 40 times more likely to raise investment. So that's the preparation phase. We need to start with this solid base of kind of core business principles. And then we need to start constructing the narrative we do that through structure, content, and clarity, which I'll explain later in a moment. And then you have the create phase. The create phase is where you design it to look beautiful, inspiring, make yourself look like the unicorn you're promising to become. A big, huge, scalable business that you want to be. It looks are really powerful, and if an investor looks at your pitch and they're uninspired, they're probably not gonna pay much attention to the content. So we need to get that bit right. Now the mistake a lot of founders are making when they go out to pitch is they start with principle six. They start by opening Canva or PowerPoint or probably some AI tool these days and say, write me a pitch for investment, here's my business idea. And they start with that blank PowerPoint slide and think, shit, what should I say and is this why? You need to work your way up to that. Great communications like layers of an onion. You start with a massive business plan, you know, 10,000 word business plan. Then you reduce it down to 10 slides and 50 words in a pitch and you do it. So let's kick off with the first step and the, and the plan. So the plan is the most important place to start. It doesn't matter whether you're raising capital from high net worth individuals, family offices, angel investors, venture capital funds. And the reason it's so important is because it allows you to start thinking strategically about your business. It allows you to map out all of the key things that an investor is going to want to know about your business in the short and the long term for your strategy. So then when you're asked these questions, whether an investor ends up reading the full plan or not, when you're asked these questions in the due diligence that follows, you've already thought about and a clear and articulate way to describe what you're doing with your business. So it makes you, it levels you up as a founder, it makes you much more compelling in your way of, of reasoning with investors on why your strategy is going to work and why they should believe in you. So I like to think of it this way, the business plan um, we can think of like this. So, so we've all taken a maths exam, I would have thought, at some point in your life. It's probably not as long ago for, for you as it was for me. Um, but if you can remember back to taking those maths exams at school, you may have even taken one more recently. Um, we were always told by our teachers, aren't we, to show our workings. And this was so the examiners knew we are not just taking a lucky guess at the answer, but we truly understood the formula we were being asked to solve. We could take them step by step through it. And you'd often get marks for your workings, even if you made the calculation wrong in your head, because you understood the formula. And this is the purpose of the business plan. The business plan are the workings behind the pitch and behind the projections. It shows the investors that you really understand your own formula for success. It gives you that credibility. It gives investors that confidence in you, and it enables you to, to better articulate your intentions and your plan of action. So once we've got that business plan in place, this creates the solid foundations, the workings behind everything else that we're going to do. And we're now going to take that business plan and we're going to create our projections. So our projections ultimately are made up, right? We can all agree that projections of an early stage company are just made up. But the point you need to, the, the purpose of these projections is more to show an investor your strategic thinking, your, your underlying financial capabilities, that you're financially literate. They know that you are not going to hit your projections. They will, um, there, there is no chance that in five years' time you're going to be doing exactly what you, revenue you said you were going to do in month 60 with your forecasts. Very little chance that's going to happen at a concept stage. As you learn more about your business, more about what works, more about what doesn't work, that will change. But the purpose of projections, the reason investors want to see them, is they want to understand your financial literacy. So they want to be able to see how you plan to spend their money, how much more money might you need in the future. That you understand some key principles around metrics and ratios for your business. This is all very boring spreadsheet stuff, but essentially different businesses operate in different ways. A supermarket chain is smashing it and their shareholding, their, their share value goes up if they make more than 1% profit a year. 
Whereas a SaaS tech company, unless you're pitching that you can achieve 30 to 40% profit margins, no one's going to be interested. So you need to understand the nuances of the business model in which you're pitching and show the investors that you understand that you need to get there to make this a valuable enterprise. Equally, a consultancy business that's looking to, to scale and grow might spend between 5 to 10% of their revenue on marketing. Whereas a tech company, because they have lower overheads, there's no staff costs, so their gross margin is higher, they might be spending 20, 30, sometimes even 40% of their revenue on marketing for growth. So if you're pitching a consultancy business and you're saying I'm going to spend 40% on marketing, then investors know that you probably don't quite understand how the profitability of your business works. And equally, if you're pitching a tech company and you're only putting 5% of revenues into marketing, they're not going to believe that that marketing budget is big enough for you to grow. So understanding these core principles around your business model is what investors are really looking for in a financial projection. It's not looking at month 52 of the forecast and then in, in uh, four and a half years' time saying you haven't hit that revenue target. That's not what it's about. It's not about you having a crystal ball. It's, about, um, it's not about predicting your future. It's about setting a roadmap and path to success. So it's basically saying if we execute the business plan I've just written, this is what's going to happen financially with the company. This is the potential. And we can cross-reference that with some of the research around the market in our business plan as to how big the market opportunity is. So equally, um, a mistake founders often make is they sit down with their spreadsheet and they go, if we grow 10% a month for the next five years, we're going to be doing 100 million per month in revenue by the end of year five. Fantastic. And then you look at their business plan with their market research and you realise the market itself is only 100 million a year in size. So how are you going to do 100 million a month? market itself is only 100 million a year in total. So you need to make sure that your growth plans mean that you're taking maybe a what, 5, 10% share of the market at best. So all of these things are what investors are looking for when it comes to that due diligence and those plans and those projections. And ultimately, they're looking at three key areas. When they're assessing your numbers, they have these three things in mind. One, growth. <coughs> is, is this projecting large growth, large and sustained growth? So can we see a path if you're, let, let's say you're at a concept stage, you haven't launched anything yet, you're very early stage revenues. If you're taking my investment, is there a path to 15 to 50 million, one five to five zero million in revenue in five or so years time? Is that possible? Does that look possible? If it's not, then maybe the business isn't big enough to deliver the investor the types of returns they're looking for. Now again, that's a rough guide. It depends on your business model and your, uh, and your sector. The general rule is, can it grow? Can it grow quickly and can it grow sustainably? You've got to avoid being conservative with these numbers as well when it comes to growth. A lot of founders kind of need to pitch to investors and say, look, these are, my, these are the forecasts, but they're very conservative. I think we could possibly do better than that. If investors were conservative, they wouldn't be investing in startup businesses. It's a 90% failure rate. If they were conservative, they'd stick all their money in an ISA. Maybe they'd invest in property or the stock market. They're investing in entrepreneurs because they want high risk because the rewards are huge. So saying to an investor, oh, these are my numbers, but they're conservative, really isn't the, the angle you want to go for. You want to, say these are, you want to be saying these are ambitious targets. It's going to be difficult for us to achieve them. We might even need a little bit of a luck along the way, but here's how we're going to make it happen. That's the angle when pitching growth. You then need to see speed. You need to see that growth happening at speed. So it's, uh, most investors are investing in a business hoping to get a return in five, five years, but in reality, 10. So you tend, the general unwritten rule is you pitch for an exit, an exitable opportunity in five years, you're big enough to exit the business and deliver returns to investors in five years, knowing it'll probably take 10 in reality. Don't know why we just don't do a 10 year forecast, but that's just the way it goes. That's just the way investors think. So they have ambitions for five years, they expect 10, and that's the speed at which we need to achieve this growth. If you're saying, I'm going to get there, but I'm going to get there in 20 years, the God's honest truth is that most angel investors don't have 20 years left on this planet to see the returns. <laughs> right? So it might be good for you, but it's not good for them. Um, so they want five to 10 years. These are wealthy individuals. They've made all their money. They're coming towards their, most of them are retirees. Um, they don't have 20 years. So you need to make sure that this growth is being projected at speed. And then, of course, we've mentioned it a little bit, um, you need to show that it positions you in an export position. The margins, the metrics, the ratios, the type of business you've built, 
shows profitability at a level that delivers the investors the type of returns they're looking for. And that will depend on, again, the type of business and the type of sector, but as a general rule of thumb, anywhere between 5 to 50x return on investment is what they're looking for. So whatever valuation you think your business is today and what you're pitching to investors for, um, your business needs to have the potential to, to at least 10x in value over five years once you've spent their, their money. So that's the preparation, right? Now we've got a solid plan. We've got a really clear um, set of projections. We know the financial roadmap ahead and what we're aiming to achieve. We now need to start telling this story to investors. We need to start creating our pitch. So we first need to start with the structure. The structure is how we tell the story. It's not what we say. It's the order in which we say it. So I often use the analogy that um, thinking about the, the structure of your pitch is like creating a university course. So 80% of angel investors, by the way, describe themselves as sector agnostic. That means that they don't specialize in investing in any given area. We're not specialists in financial technology or we're not specialists in restaurants. We invest in any business we think has huge potential. We're sector the reality is they have their preferences, but they will tell you they're sector agnostic. But it means that the majority of investors that you're going to be pitching to are not necessarily experts in the sector in which you operate. So you can't assume they know the core things about your industry that you might find as kind of normal, as, as industry speak. So we need to structure the course. And the reason I use the um, idea of a university course, and I'm nervous now because I'm in front of some university professors who write, this is an absolutely terrible analogy, but it works in my head anyway. Um, so if I was creating a new university course, let's say I was inventing a brand new university course on physics, um, I wouldn't start lesson one, semester one, on a complex topic like string theory. I would start lesson one, semester one, with probably actually the first half of a semester is everything you learn at A-levels, making sure you, one, remember it after the uh, summer break, and and two, making sure that those that um, uh, those that only just about got into the course were leveled up so everyone was on the same level playing field as a starting point. And then I would delve deeper into the subject over the years till the point at which the final semester in year three, we could probably start to approach string theory. And the same is true when it comes to thinking about how you tell the story of your business. You have to assume that the investor you're pitching to has no understanding of your business, your sector, your concept, the problem that's being, that, that you're aiming to solve, that they have a completely blank slate. Imagine they're a seven-year-old child and work from that basis. So the start of your pitch is about just getting them on board with the concept and then you build their knowledge as you go through the slide. So this is a um, structure I've created. It's called the five acts of the perfect pitch and it really helps you think about the order in which you want to explain the information. So the reason the five act structure works, um, and I'll come back to explain these very briefly in a second, is we've been using a five act structure for storytelling for years. You may, if you've ever attempted any creative writing, you may have come across this. If you studied Shakespeare, you may have come across this. Um, he, he was a massive fan. This comes from the ancient Greeks. Shakespeare was a massive fan in the five act structure. Nearly all of his works are in five acts. And you've got the exposition, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution. It's the way we've been telling stories for centuries, and we're really receptive to being communicated to in this way. And when you read, and I go into a bit more depth in my book, but when you read the definitions for each of these five acts, they're remarkably similar, and there's remarkable parallels to a pitch that works for raising investment. So we can use the same kind of principles of five acts to tell our story. So the first is the hook. The hook is where we set the big vision. We get investors excited, not by the financial vision of the future, but the, the vision beyond making money. How are we going to change the world? Why is this exciting for me to even start to pay attention to? Then we need to talk about the essence of the business, the core value proposition. What's the problem you're solving? What's the solution you're op offering? Why is it unique? What, uh, why is now a good time for this to succeed? is now the perfect timing and that's why they need to get on board today and not tomorrow. What's the essence of the business? Then we need the evidence. The evidence is the climax to our story. This 
is where we deliver the killer blow with investors. Because till this point, they go, fantastic, brilliant idea. I can see that there's a market need. I can imagine this solution being adopted by your proposed customers. But <coughs> is that actually going to happen in real life? So we want to show some evidence. If you're, if you're pre-launch, this is research, primary and secondary research around your market focus group, survey, data, that convinces you and also investors that this is worth taking forward. If you're post-launch, if you've already got some customers, if you've already got some, um, some users on your platform, this is all about showing that you're achieving growth, you're getting uh, bigger and bigger by the day, even without investment. You've reached a certain point and now investment unlocks the next stage in the journey. We're, we're attracting customers, they love what we do, here's the results they get, this is the time they spend on the platform. Just statistics, data, evidence that this is something the market wants and something the market we then move into the plan. This is a summary of that business plan I was talking about earlier, a handful of slides that just articulate some of the top level thinking in that strategy so an investor can look at you and go, it's worth my time sitting down with this individual in another, uh, in a second meeting because there's actually some, some substance behind this. It's not just someone who had an idea in the pub last night and has put together some fancy slides. There's actually some thought that's gone into this and I can see myself being able to have a really good strategic discussion and then you have the ask, as well. ask for the money. So many founders forget to ask for some money when they pitch. Um, you need to ask for the money, there needs to be a call to action. This is how much we're raising, this is what we're spending it on, this is, how, this is the res financial result it's going to deliver. So we show a top level for, uh, a summary of our forecasts, how much investment we want, what equity we're selling, what valuation you're pitching at, so that you can be sure that you and your investors are on the same page when it comes to those details. And again, it gives them that confidence that they're going to be able to sit down and talk through both the details around the financials and the details around the actual investment opportunity in more detail if they were to take the conversation forward. So why does this work? Why do the five act structures work? Well, it's all about making an emotional and a logical connection with the investor. So the first couple of acts create an emotional connection. It speaks to the investor's heart. It gets them excited by your vision. The final two acts create a logical connection. It speaks to the investor's head. It ticks off all their checklist of requirements. It reassures them that it's worth their time investing their time in finding out more about you. And the evidence is kind of the connection between the two. It's where we transition the narrative from the emotional to the logical part of the pitch. Because we're using social proof, evidence, fact, to validate the emotional feeling that the investors have. The emotional feeling that this is a brilliant idea and has there is something there, there's something exciting about it. So we're preparing them in that moment to start taking on more logical and factual information in the final parts of the pitch. And that's why it really really works because we're taking them on a journey. Any great marketing executive or advertising expert will tell you that the best campaigns speak to the head and the heart. We all make emotional and logical decisions when we buy something. And all you're really doing is you're selling your shares to investors. The product you're selling is shares, the customer, but potential investors. It's exactly the same process as any other sales and marketing strategy. Speak to the head and the heart, the emotion and the logic. So once we've figured out our structure, once we know what we want to say and the order in which we want to say it, we need to create the content for the pitch. So this content needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, it needs to be articulate. No more than 75 words a slide, ideally 50. We don't want streams of text, this isn't your business plan. So how do you condense a 10,000 word business plan into a handful of slides of uh, maybe 50 words? Use the setup and score format. So, the setup and score format is quite simple. The setup is an engaging headline for your pitch. So most people, when they create a, an investor pitch, have headlines, the problem, the solution, key milestones. It doesn't tell the investor anything. Most investors will get a pitch into their inbox, they'll flick through it in a matter of uh, usually less than a minute according to, to um, tracking data. Um, and then if they like what they see, they'll go back and read it in full. So these headlines are a wasted opportunity by most Founders, it needs to be something meaningful, not our solution, not the problem, not key milestones. So let me give you uh, an example. We, we really want to be focusing on the conclusion for which we want the investor to come to when they've read your each slide. So if you think about what's the one big takeaway that you want the investor to remember about you and your business having digested the information on that slide of your pitch, that's usually your headline. So instead of key milestones, it might be proof of concept developed and ready to launch. That's the thing you want them to remember, that you 
you've not just had the idea, you've actually built the proof of concept and you feel like it's now ready to launch. So think about what the conclusion is. You can then start um, telling the investor how to think through the words that you choose. They'll come away and they'll agree that that is the case. You're not leaving them to come to that conclusion themselves. So the headline, something meaningful, the conclusion of your slide, and then you follow up with short and snappy pieces of content. You smash home the point, you back that up with some key pieces of information. It could be a single sentence, could be a couple of bullet points. So we set up and then we score. So here's a couple of examples. The headline sets it up, the copy smashes home the point. Personalized health management and monitoring. That's what they do, not our solution. Personalized health management and monitoring using AI and machine learning per doc drives powerful insights from clinic and clinical and patient generated data to enable better disease management. One sentence, that's it. We do not need paragraphs to describe your solution. If you can't do it in one headline in a sentence, then you're probably doing it wrong. That being said, here's a version of three sentences. Um, so, so here's where we use three sort of bullet points. So we make it really clear. Automated savings that grow as you spend. Not our solution, automated savings that grow as you spend. That's what we do. That sounds exciting. I want to find out more. If I remember one thing about this business is that it automates my savings that grow as, they, uh, as I spend. Fantastic. How do we do that? Also save money finding auto cash back and then what, four or five words that describe what each of those core feature sets are. That's it. No more. So once you've written the content, you need to go back and check for clarity. Clarity is key. You, you're, remember we said 520 pitch decks leading to two investments a year for most investors. You're fighting off, what's that, what's the math? 500, it's 518 other businesses for this money. The clearer you are with investors, the more likely you are to secure their funding. So it's worth going through your content and checking for Clarity. So think of it like a, um, the best way to do it is most people start with the slides and the, and the design. If you start with a blank piece of paper in Word and just go slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four, or Google Docs or whatever, and just write it in black and white aerial text. Then go away a couple of days. You'll, you'll slave away over it. You'll, you'll create all this content. You think I've absolutely smashed it. Go away for a few days. Don't think about it. Do something else. Come back to it and realize how terrible it is and then work through it again, and then do that again. Do that two or three times, and eventually you'll get something cl uh, clear and articulate. Be careful who you test it on. The temptation to go and test this content on a load of people. Um, be very selective as to who your family are going to tell you you're great. They always do. Um, they're not going to give you objective feedback. Um, investors will end up asking you to give more information, interestingly. So if they always want more, purpose of the pitch, remember, is to have them book a meeting with you so you can give them more. So when you go and test this content on investors, normally they'll, they'll ask a load of questions and you'll think, shit, I haven't covered those things, I better add it. And then you end up back where you started. When really you want to go and deliver them that pitch and then they say, this sounds great, could you tell me more about this, this, this and this? And you go, absolutely I can, let's talk, talk through it. And now you're in a conversation with them, now you're building rapport, now you're building a relationship. So, so just because an investor is saying that they want more information, they need to know more, doesn't mean that you should add it to your pitch. So you have to be really careful about who you approach to check for clarity. But it's essentially like panning for gold. You want to be going through your content, removing all the silt, so that you're left with the golden nuggets of communication. Is there a way to, con are you repeating yourself in a couple of slides if you've mentioned the same thing twice? Is there a better way to express what you're saying with one bullet point instead of two? All of those sorts of things. Just refine it until you get to the gold. And then finally, step six is the, is the design. And the design, as I sort of mentioned earlier, is super important. You want to look like the unicorn you're promising to be, the billion dollar or multi-million dollar business that you believe you can become. It's the first thing an investor's going to see, isn't it? It's the design. They're going to open this up and they're going to be instantly hit by the design and within four seconds they're going to decide whether or not this looks good or bad. Now, if Regardless of all of this effort you've put up to this point, if the initial reaction is, oh, this looks a bit shit, I suppose I better, I suppose I better give it a go, um, they're instantly engaging in this with a negative mindset, and you're having to convince them that, no, actually, this business is shit, I'm just terrible at design. Um, if it looks like a billion-dollar business already, and it looks well-considered and branded, one, it shows how much you care about your business and what it looks like to the, to the outside world, 
two, the initial reaction is, oh, this looks cool, can't wait to find out more about this. Completely different psychological mindset. We've probably all experienced this um, when we go and buy something online and you end up on a dodgy website. And the product's perfectly good, probably. They've got loads of great reviews, but something's telling you maybe those reviews are fake because this website looks proper dodgy. It's that same principle, right? It needs to look good to get them over that hurdle. And here's why. It's because we've been communicating visually as a species for longer than we've been able to speak. So Paleolithic cavemen would etch not just what they saw, but their thoughts and feelings on the side of cave walls. And that means that as a species, we digest visual information 6,000 times faster than text. So just think about a social post you've seen recently, a video or an image. You could probably recall that instantly, and if you were to ask to describe it in detail, it would probably take you three or four pages of text to talk about everything that's in the photo and you know, the colour of everything. Think about um, how long it might take to, to, how much information needs to be expressed in a book when, versus what it could be converted to into a film when you, when you show the visuals. Because you don't have to explain everything, it happens instantly, you understand it in that moment. So this is a really great tool for getting your, your message across, bypassing this basic human instinct of fear. Essentially, for an investor, you are a stranger asking them for money. That's, you've just landed in their inbox and said, hey, I heard you're rich. Can you give me a hundred thousand pounds for my business or a million pounds for my business? It's like, who the hell are you? Go away. They don't trust you. Your basic human instinct, your caveman brain, is saying you can't trust this individual. But with, with great design, with great visuals, with great communication, you bypass that caveman instinct. You bypass that, that um, most basic part of our brain, and it allows people to open up and start to trust you without even having met you. And that's why the design is so important in this process, but not where you should start. So that's the six principles. Um, we, we really need to be... Um, thinking about going through this step by step. You don't want to be starting with design, which is the natural default for most founders, and then work back through trying to create some content and then think, oh crap, I've been invited in for a second meeting, I better create a business plan and some financials now. We need to do it the other way around so that we're fully prepared and that when we're in those moments with investors, we're much more likely to succeed. So a little bit of a case study there. So, so um, Plend have used this um, method with us. They're one of our clients. We've done two rounds of funding with them now. Um, the first round, they were pitching for 400K for their FinTech platform, and they ended up with 700K. And more recently, they closed 40 million, 40 million for their, for their business in their most recent round of funding, which um, was pretty insane. Ended up with headlines all over Europe um, as a result. It was a crazy big round, but um, uh, yeah, proper exciting. Um, so that you can check whether or not you're pitch ready, you can go to pitchready.co.uk and you can test yourself against these key principles. Um, you get a free report um, on your investability, so have a go at that so you can see where you stand if you've got a business that you're working on right now. Um, you can get a copy of my book from the Robot Mascot website. You can go there, you can get it post free in the post. You can get a PDF or an audio book as well if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, connect with me on socials. Uh, James Church on LinkedIn and Facebook, at James Church 88 on Twitter and uh, X and Instagram, sorry, it's not fashion. Um, and then, um, yeah, Robot Mascot on YouTube where I do kind of regular, regular videos on raising investment. So that's it. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, it was amazing. Let's just uh, see if there's any questions here. Anyone wants to ask any questions? Uh, first question, okay. yes, please. Um, do you think there is a, a difference when you're pitching to UK investors compared to US investors? <laughs> 100%. So I noticed from the accent you might be from the other side of the pond. <laughs> no, no. No? Okay, I'm just leaving the joke But yes, 100%. The, uh, so um, investors in the US, so there's a very different culture. Um, in the US, failure is almost like a badge of honor. Um, it's kind of, I've, fi I've failed five businesses, so the next one's definitely going to be a success. Give me loads of money. And everyone goes, yeah, you failed five times. Here's a load of cash. <laughs> in the UK we're, and Europe, we're very different, much more reserved, much more um, thoughtful um, in terms of who we invest in, and, and, and we take a very different approach, this much more structured, more detailed approach. So 
The reason for that is quite simple. When you look at the profile of investors in Silicon Valley, 80% of angel investors are ex-entrepreneurs who have sold their business. And they go, you remind me of me when I was young. You're going to figure it out. It's probably not going to be this, um, but you're going to adapt and change and grow, and we're going to end up with something valuable out of it. Whereas 80% of UK and European investors come from the city of London. They're ex-bankers, they're ex um, Give me, a, give me a spreadsheet, give me a business case, and then we'll make a decision as to whether or not we'll make that internal investment in our corporation. So it's a very different mindset, and because of that, it's a very different type of pitching scenario, which is why we talk about this for, for our European market. Still valid for pitching in the States, because it's pretty impressive that you've gone to that detail, but, but um, it's more important to get that vision right and, and kind of build relationships with, with ex-entrepreneurs in the States. Very good. If I may add perhaps to this, my my comment would be in the US you have more unicorns, right? So if you have a bigger chance of, or you have a, a you have the, a, the probability of making outside returns, I might take a bigger risk, right? That's it. The numbers of unicorns in Europe, in particular in, in Europe, perhaps not in London, but in Europe in general, is much lower, right? Mm -hmm. So we create good businesses, but for example, we know in the London Stock Exchange, the numbers for outstanding growth business is very small versus the US. That's so it. I think the risk taking is different, mm -hmm. but I think it's true. It's always good, of course, to have a good pitch. Let me just, any other question? Yes, and uh, no, perhaps then, oh, then, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> then uh, we'll come back to you, yeah. Please. I wanted to ask why, like, in your personal experience, what's like really important when forming a team? Forming a team? Yeah, so varied skill sets. So you don't want two founders who can do the same thing, ideally. You want someone who visionary, someone who can pitch the idea, communicate it, get customers on board, be that kind of sales and marketing and kind of face of the brand, and then, then you probably want someone alongside you who's more technical, more operations orientated. Um, an absolute ideal team for any investor would, would include an exited entrepreneur, so someone who's been there and done it before, or, but, but you know, the, it's very, you know, how do you get there without first facing investment? So I say everyone has to start somewhere, but yeah, investors, Although many of our clients are sole founders and, and they do perfectly well, the general rule is that investors invest in teams for that reason, because you have different, you have more resource available for free, essentially, than, than having to recruit it and pay for it, and also they want those varied skill sets. Interestingly, I saw research not that long ago that suggests that the survival rate and the success rate of sole founded companies is higher. So why investors choose to invest in teams is actually contradicts the data of that sole founded businesses because with teams, with a co-founding team, there's also the huge risk of a fallout. So at any point you could decide to go in a different direction and fall out and then the business is, is in jeopardy. So as an investor that's also a risk. So they're, they're kind of trying to balance this idea of kind of a team that's solid enough that they're not going to split up it's like a marriage um, and then if you do if you do get together with another co-founder you need a prenup in place a founders agreement that says this is what happens if one of us decides to leave um, so you've got to have those things in place to so investors feel comfortable with that risk um, but sole founders generally are more successful in the longer term because they are just they can just make a decision without worrying about anyone else's feelings essentially so uh, yeah it's it, it team is good but there is benefits to not having Next question, I think you had another question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously, um, although investors, they, you know, like as you said, they, can't, can't remember the word you used, but like they invest like in a range of businesses, not yeah. specialized, but obviously they each one has like their own preference and, you know, like portfolio of companies they've invested for before. To what extent should you like um, adapt your every pitch deck to the particular investor. Yeah, um, so there's two schools of thought on, on this. One is try and make it a bit more personalized, but only, only really if you're a super confident communicator. So uh, the story I often use on this, it's better to do the same thing again. I've been giving this talk for three, four years now and I've barely changed it. Um, Martin Luther King, probably the, the most inspiring pitch that has ever been pitched. Um, he, um, 
he did the high, I have a dream speech up and down the US for years, about two years in nearly every church um, before his TV address. And then he got the opportunity to speak on TV and he said, well, everyone's heard it. Everyone who's gonna listen to me has already heard it because I've been to nearly every church in the country and given this same talk, this I have a dream speech. So he decided to change his speech and he, he, he turned it, uh, created a new speech called the blank check speech. And it was about how America had given ethnic minorities a, a, a dud check. Um, and he was giving this sort of, all the crowds piled in, he was giving this talk and they was getting restless, they started turning away. And one of one, a soul singer who used to accompany him on his tours, who used to do a bit of warm up and singing, if you listen very, very carefully to the footage, you can hear a, tell them about the dream, Martin, tell them about the dream. And he switched to his tried and tested pitch that he could give, deliver with passion and enthusiasm and knew off by heart and suddenly, and then all of a sudden it became the most compelling and impressive pitch and speech in, in probably history. So there's a lot to be said for just sticking with what you know and then allowing the investor themselves to decide what they think is important. So I'd like to drill more into your marketing strategy because I come from a marketing background. Or I'd love to delve more into your finances because that's what I really understand. So as a general rule, I would say keep it the same because then you can get confident at telling that story, which is your story, which is the most important way to communicate it to you. And the investor will have their own area of expertise that they'll want to delve into and then you can take the conversation from there. So that makes your life simpler um, by doing it that way, I think, as well. Yeah, thank you. Any last question? Last question. Um, you mentioned that it's not the ideas that raise the investment, but the, the communication. When you're giving an investment, do you, how how would you split up um, trying to promote the business versus yourself, like the strengths of which? Because they're investing in the business, but like you said, they're also investing in you as yeah. the founder. So the pitch should communicate you the, the business, but in the way that you communicate it, it should be showcasing you as a founder at the same time and how credible you are. But when it comes to particular elements of the pitch, we talk about the team, you talk about yourself, the more you can do to show impressive insights into the market, the better. And this can be done off uh, outside the pitch as well. So think about a pitch lands in your inbox. What's the, if I'm impressed by this, what's my next port of call? Probably checking the founder out on LinkedIn, seeing what they really stand for. So if that LinkedIn profile is full of really interesting thought leadership around the problem you're solving, all this market research you've done, and these surveys you've conducted, and these experiments you've done, and you're talking about all this stuff you've discovered, not necessarily about the product, not trying to sell what you're doing, you're just saying, I'm a thought leader in this space, here's ideas around this problem that exists and how it could be solved, and we're working on something, that's gonna give them the sense that this is a really impressive founder um, that has real deep insights and meaningful um, data around, because they wanna be able to say, you, how, any, anyone could pitch this idea to me, ideas are free, but you are definitely the person to make this happen. Someone else could walk in with the same idea, but I don't think they'd be able to touch you in terms of your ability to execute on this. So the more you can build up that sort of personal brand, that founder brand, of being kind of a thought leader in your space, the more likely you are to, to raise the funding. Thank you so much. So we would like, like to invite uh, my colleague, Professor Kay Nightingale, to see some word of thanks. Thank you, over to you, Kay. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I'm sure everyone, we are going to give uh, James a good round of applause in a minute or two. Um, I only heard about this book, thank you to you, Jacob, well, and so. arranging this. So I ordered it, bought it, and I've read it um, in prep for this. It's been a, a bit of a quick read, mm -hmm. and I will give it more time over the weekend, but I highly recommend it for one reason. Um, it comes across as rather obvious. Great, it's a compliment. When you read this book, you read each page and you think, oh, that's obvious, of, of course we should do that. Oh, it's obvious, of course they should do that. It's obvious, of course they should do that. But what's clear, based on all of the research you've done, based on practical experience with all of these founders, is people don't do it. They're not doing what is obvious that they should be doing. So I found it a really great book to read simply because it's clearly based on a depth of knowledge and research, but it's written in a way that makes you just think, oh, it's obvious. So if it's obvious, I advocate to you, well, do it then, okay? Just do what's in the book. So 
thank you hugely no, thank you. for bringing such an obvious and yet well-researched piece of writing for everyone to actually now take and do what they need to do. Thank so thank you, James. Thank you very well. Pleasure to meet you. Well. Thank you so much. I think you all need uh, to give a, 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 a round of applause.